Greetings, friends around the world. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel. Does Satan have a throne? Well, more than half a dozen times, my wife Joyce and I have been able to see what someone had called Satan's throne, if the devil does, in fact, have a physical throne on the earth. The first time we saw it was back in 1987, during a tour of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. Now, the tour was conducted by a Worldwide Church of God minister, and he mentioned that the then Pastor General of the Old Worldwide Church of God, Joseph Takacha Sr., when he had visited St. Peter's, he declared the Cathedral Petri was Satan's throne. The tour guide mentioned that there was a tradition or legend that the final pope would sit in this throne. Now, if you look at this throne, you see that it's black, and, the, and it's interesting, the bottom of its legs are about five feet off the ground. It's got a bright sun on the top of it. And despite odd claims, by the way, no one allegedly ever sat on the final version of this. Now, it's called the Cathedra Petri. Cathedra means chair, and it's from that term we get the word cathedral. Anyway, the Cathedra Petri was designed by an Italian sculptor named Bernini. I want to go through a little bit of a history about it. As a young boy, Gian Lorenzo Bernini visited St. Peter's and stated his wish to build a mighty throne for the Apostle. As a young man in 1626, he received the patronage of Pope Urban VIII and worked on the embellishment of the basilica, and then turned his attention to another precious relic, the so-called Cathedra Petri, or Throne of St. Peter, a chair which was often claimed to have been used by the Apostle, but appears to date from the 12th century. As the chair itself was fast deteriorating and was no longer serviceable, Pope Alexander VII determined to enshrine it in suitable splendor as the object upon which the line of successor to Peter was based. Bernini created a large bronze throne in which it was housed, raised high up on four looping supports, held effortlessly by massive bronze statues of four doctors of the church, Saints Ambrose and Augustine, representing the Latin church, and Athanasius and John Chrysostom, the Greek church. Now, there's actually no evidence that Peter had his chair or his bench, or some bench he may have sat on, to turn into this. But the reality is that uh, some chair or throne or seat had existed for some period of time uh, by the time Bernini came by, and, it, and then he did something over top of it. Now the Catholic Encyclopedia teaches about at least two chairs. I'll just read a little bit from an article I have on this. The Church at Rome celebrated on 18 January the memory of the day when the Apostle held his first service with the faithful of the Eternal City. This double celebration was also held in two places, in the Vatican Basilica and in the cemetery on the Via Salaria. At both places, a chair, cathedra, was venerated. Now, before going any further, I should mention that it's, a, it's by tradition, as opposed to historical fact, that Peter actually uh, was in Rome, or that he entered it on the 18th of January of some year. There's also no evidence that he conducted any church service in Rome on some particular chair. Now, it should be pointed out that the Catholic Encyclopedia article admits, by the way, there's at least couple of chairs, and uh, one of them was destroyed, and other chairs came from other places. Now the idea to venerate physical objects like this seems to become, became acceptable to the Church of Rome after the sun-worshipping Emperor Constantine rose up and influenced people. Original, early, faithful Christians most certainly did not venerate some chair. Now the historical reality is the Cathedral Petri is not really Peter's throne, uh, nor a place from where he ruled all Christendom. There's no evidence that 
Peter claimed to have or rule from some kind of a throne. Now it should be pointed out that even the Vatican doesn't believe that the true cathedral chair of authority is in St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, but it's actually in the Basilica of St. John's Lateran. But that building does not have the actual chair. Uh, but allegedly it's a physical location of authority for the Church of Rome. And unlike Vatican City, St. John's Lateran is actually within the seven hills of Rome. And actually, uh, my family and I have actually walked from St. Peter's all the way to St. John's Lateran. It's a little bit of a walk, but it could be done. Well, anyway, there was a pope who was Pope uh, Damascus. He apparently believed he was transferring the physical seat or chair of Peter to Vat the Vatican. Just because he felt that way, it didn't make it so. Some sources claim that part of the reason for the legend of Cathedral Petri as well as why there were multiple seats and chairs or thrones, was essentially that in the late 2nd and 3rd centuries, competing power blocks made up stories in order to try to gain prominence. It's also been asserted that the seat underneath the Cathedral of Petri, that is all built over, uh, came from either the 8th century or later, uh, like say the 12th century or whatever. Yeah. As it turns out, some believe that the final pope of the, on the Roman Catholic bishop Malachi's prophesied list of popes, who is called Peter the Roman, will sit on the Cathedral Petri in St. Peter's Basilica. Some consider he's going to be an anti-pope, hence a henchman for Satan. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with Malachi's list, in the 12th century, Malachi somewhat predicted, with what some believe is complete accuracy, every pope since the year 1143. Now, when Malachi's list became public in the 16th century, it was considered so accurate in predicting the 12th to 16th century popes, many thought that uh, it was written after the fact. But the fact that it's also been seemingly accurate about popes since up until the 20th and 21st century, has given credence to the view that it actually could have originated in the 12th century through a vision that uh, Bishop Malachi had. Now I want to read a little bit from the Catholic Cyclopedia about this. In 1139, St. Malachi gave his manuscript to Innocent II to console him in the midst of his tribulations. And the discovery of that document remained unknown in the Roman archives until its discovery in 1590. These short prophetical announcements in number 112 indicate some noticeable trait of all future popes from Celestine II, who was elected in the year 1143, until the end of the world. Now, it should be pointed out, especially for Roman Catholics, that Malachi's list is only completely accurate supposedly, if several antipopes are counted. And the final one on the Malachi list is believed by some to be the final antichrist. I want to read something from the Roman Catholic priest Connor. Quote, When Malachi visited Pope Innocent II in Rome in 1139, he was given a vision of all the holy fathers of the future. A study of the entire prophecy shows that the fulfillment is made possible only by including antipopes, which should tip people off of clear Roman Catholics. This is a demonic vision. I'd like to read something from a Roman Catholic uh, writer by the name of David Lindsay. After the 266 Pope, according to St. Malachi, there will be no more popes. In addition to being the last Pontiffs, some visionaries hint that the 266th Pontiff will be the Antichrist. And you said, wait a second, you just said Malachi's list only has 112 and it says 266. That's correct. It's because the Church of Rome has all these other Pontiffs prior to 1143. When you add them all up, you get 266. Now I'd like to read something regarding the Malachi prophecy from a Roman Catholic priest. Malachi, 12th century. During the persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit upon the throne 
Peter the Roman, who will feed his flock through many tribulations, after which the city of seven hills, Rome, will be utterly destroyed, and the awful judge will then judge the people. Now, as it turns out, the Bible warns against a religious city that's going to rule from seven hills. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 17, start with verse 9, and read this from NIV. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Verse 18. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So we see that the Bible is condemning this seven-hilled city. And by the way, Roman Catholic scholars know that this is a reference to Rome. They argue the time frame, but they do agree it's got to do with Rome. Anyways, it turns out the Bible does specifically use the expression Satan's throne once. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. This will be from the New King James. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you will hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Oedipus was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So yes, we see, according to the Bible, Satan does have a throne. Now, related to those passages, Smith's Bible Dictionary notes, is called Satan's Seat by John, which some supposed to refer to the worship of Aesculapius from the serpent being the, his characteristic emblem. Anyway, that particular throne or seat, presuming it involved a physical one, probably was not the same one that we see in St. Peter's. Mainly because the main time for Pergamus was from 450 to uh, 1050 AD. The throne could have, the piece of wood that's in the Cathedral of Petri, maybe it came from there, but Many say it was later than that. Anyway, just like the initial local church at Pergamos at the time the Apostle John was inspired to write the Revelation, was situated in a city where Satan swayed human politics, uh, much of uh, the work of God's church during this time, Pergamos time, occurred within the bounds of the government of Satan's Eastern Roman Empire. Whether it was physically there or not, in a spiritual sense, it's the same throne. Why? Well, there's four basic reasons. First of all, the Roman Empire had two divisions. The West, which is based out of Rome, and the East, based out of Constantinople, Byzantium. While in the West, the fall of Rome is taught in history, the fact that the entire eastern leg of the empire lasted about a thousand years longer is actually tends to be virtually unknown. And it existed before and after the entire time of uh, the Pergamus portion of the Church of God dominated. You know, prophetic writers, including Roman Catholic ones, tended to consider that the two legs of the image of the beast have to do with the division of the old Roman Empire. And while the old Roman Empire is no more, there's still a difference between the West, which tends toward Ro Roman Catholicism and its Protestant daughters, and the East, which tends more toward the Eastern Orthodox. But historically, uh, the schism of 1054 notwithstanding, they supported the same goals, the same body, and the same throne. And they're sort of working together on that kind of thing now. And then, again, on the physical throne, the Cathedral, Cathedral Petri, two of the Latin fathers, if you want to call them that, and two of the Greek fathers, so-called. Now, the second of the four reasons is because the Bible teaches that the harlot woman, who presumably have two legs, and who sits on the city of seven hills, and by the way, both Rome and Constantinople are cities of seven hills or seven mountains. As a matter of fact, that's why Constantinople was chosen, because it was supposed to be the new Rome. Anyway, the harlot woman has a history of persecuting the real saints, those of the genuine church of God. 
So let's go to Revelation chapter 17, starting verse 1. Read a little bit about her. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me into the, the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So from these passages, we see this harlot woman reigns and has history of persecuting the saints. This is the same woman who sits on the seven hills and, and reigns. And the throne, known as Cathedral Petri, is considered to be a throne of importance, at least to Rome. A third reason to bring this up is that's due to the fact that the Cathedral Petri has a sun on top of it. Now, while that's not proof, I'd like to read something the old Radio Church of God published in their old Plain Truth magazine in February 1960. In Revelation 2, 13-14, Christ speaks to the church of Pergamos, says, I know your works, even where Satan's seat is. Thou hast there from them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. In Pergamos, which was outstandingly Satan's seat, the sun divinity Baal, Balaam's doctrine was idolatrous sun worship, was worshipped under the form of a serpent, under the name of uh, Iscopolopius, the man instructing serpent. In Satan's seat, over 60 years after Christ's time, the main worship was sun and serpent. This sun and devil worship was transferred to Rome when Pergamus became part of the Roman Empire. The other portion of it. According to the fundamental doctrine of the mysteries as brought from Pergamus to Rome. The sun was the only god. In Pergamus, the sun had been worshipped as a serpent. So we see the connection of Pergamus, the sun god, along with the sun on the uh, Cathedral Petri, as long as also information about a ser serpent, Satan. So that gives us pause whether or not this could be Satan's throne, because Satan has long advocated sun god worship. Now the fourth comment to bring up here is that the foundation of the so-called Cathedral Petri is supposed for doctors of the church, two being Latin and two being uh, Greek, Eastern Orthodox. So it's long been the intent of this throne to portray Greco-Roman unity because they're all shown supporting the same throne. Now from a Church of God perspective, these four individuals are kind of interesting. And I'm going to go over uh, them in sort of like their chronological impact. That's the order I'm going to do it. First is Athanasius. He was at the Council of Nicaea in 325 and he was able to persuade Emperor Constantine to support the idea of a trinity, which at the time was a very small minority position among the Greco-Roman bishops, maybe 10 or 15 percent who attended. Additionally, according to the Catholic Cyclopedia, an article on the Holy Ghost, Athanasius' paper, roughly 360 AD, was the first to clearly and fully explain the current Greco-Roman doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now, Roman Catholic prophecy warns that in the end time, you'll have to deal with a group, like the Church of God, that denies Athanasius' view on the unity of God. Now, the next one to talk about is Ambrose. Now, Ambrose was a major factor in promoting and getting Athanasius' view of the Holy Spirit adopted. He and uh, the others also pushed celibacy. Now, the Trinitarian view, he'll get a adopted by the Council of Constantinople in 381. And that resulted in 
Church of God persecution from that time on, and we were called uh, madmen, etc., by Emperor Theodosius at the time. And Ambrose is also known for his work on the Roman Catholic sacraments, which they didn't have that way prior. And the next is John Chrysostom. Now, Chrysostom was a big advocate of the Greco-Roman religious holidays, and in 387, a big condemner of God's holy days, as observed by the Church of God. His views have often been cited throughout history. Uh, he was also an anti-Semite, and I think his views will be used against the Church of God in the future. And last, the fourth one, Augustine or Augustine, Mainly in the 5th century, he used writings of Ambrose to expand upon these sacra sacraments. And while he wasn't the first person to turn against the teaching of the biblical doctrine of the millennium, he's been one of the main so-called intellectual discounters that the Greco-Roman churches have relied on. Since the millennial doctrine is the only doctrine listed in the current catechism of the Catholic Church as associated with Antichrist, it's likely that Satan's supporters will use Augustine's writings against those of us in the true Church of God because we teach the millennium. So the physical reality is that the foundation holding up the so-called Cathedra Petri is based on Greco-Roman leaders who often took strong intellectual positions against original doctrine and those held by the Church of God. This is one reason, spiritually at least, the Cathedra Petri represents Satan's throne. Now, biblical, Roman Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox prophecies suggest that Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics will unify, and they will strongly support leaders that the Bible shows Satan is going to inspire. False leaders who are likely to have complete access to St. Peter's Basilica and the so-called Cathedral Petri, and who for a while will advocate the positions of those foundational doctrines, doctors of the throne there. Now, it turns out the Bible tells the time when a leader called the King of the North in Daniel 11 will set up the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem. And the Bible also talks about a man of sin will sit in the temple of God in the end times. So let's read a little bit about these. Daniel 11, verse 31, referring to the king of the north. And fortresses shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortresses. fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now I want to go into the New Testament, read about this leader as well, 2 Thessalonians 2, starting verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. If this cathedra petri, or is there actually a, a different kind of a chair in the Basilica of St. John's Lateran, is moved to the Church of God in Jerusalem's western wall. Now that building is commonly called the Cenacle. It's possible that could fulfill some of the prophecies I just read in Daniel 11 and 2 Thessalonians 2. We'll see. But the biblical reality, as we read from Revelation chapter 2, Satan does have a throne. In the end times, it's possible that Satan or one of his, his demonically inspired representatives may literally sit upon the black throne found in Vatican City. And some legends are if he sits on it, the throne will actually go down to the ground instead of being raised up. Anyway, whether or not it literally will be the throne of Satan, the basis of the so-called Cathedral Petri and its anti-Church of God foundation with those doctors of their church suggest reasons why spiritually it seems to represent Satan's throne. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel.